Hi, this is Caroline Lewis with a special announcement. Our Working Preacher Fall campaign is in full swing, and we are so grateful to each and every one of you who have given so generously already. Working Preacher relies on donors like you to provide quality content week after week. If you missed the sold out Craft of Preaching conference in October, we have a surprise for you. When you make a gift to the Working Preacher Fall Campaign, you will get access to all of the resources and materials from the conference. Go to workingpreacher.org today to unlock your gift and support this important resource for preachers around the globe. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. The text this week uh, for November 22nd, 2020, uh, which is Christ the King Sunday, uh, is Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 through 16, verses 20 through 24. The psalm is Psalm 95, verses 1 through 7. The second reading is the, uh, from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. And the gospel is Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. And you may have noticed that uh, we are still missing uh, Matt Skinner. Um, uh, this week we uh, miss him as he continues uh, in his teaching, uh, and we are glad that you found us. Uh, you probably noticed some difference with the uh, website, um, same URL, but you found us, and we're glad that you are joining us again this week for the Sermon Brainwave. And we hope that you uh, are, enjoy the new site. A lot of great, uh, great updates and changes. We've been working on that for quite a while, haven't we? And uh, so it was, it was time for a little bit of a few updates. So we were really excited about it and some of the new things that you can uh, do with that. So let us know what you think uh, about, uh, about the new site. But happy reign of Christ or Christ the King uh, Sunday to uh, all y'all uh, out there and youth to... Sermon Brainwavers. Uh, it's an important Sunday uh, in the church year. And, you know, we, we talk about this frequently in terms of, do you preach the text? Do you preach the festival day? And we're, we're, we're always in kind of tensions around that. But uh, I'm going to go back on um, some of my, my, my usual is like preach, you know, how does the text, how does a particular text, and I still want to talk about that, but how does the particular text uh, reveal, what does it reveal to us about the reign of Christ or the, the Christ, uh, Christ as King? What is it about this text that helps us answer that specific, um, answer that specific question or helps us unpack that? And I want to get to that, but uh, it is, I, I was in a conversation with one of our members at our church who's doing some writing for our services, and he emailed me uh, and he said, so what's the, what's the deal with Christ the King? <laughs> and his deal was not like, he can look it up and he, you know, it, he didn't know that it used to be on Reformation. And then we moved it to the, I mean, he, he did, he wasn't asking what the history was because he could find that, but he was asking me, like, why do I, what do I think about Christ the King? Like, why do, why do I think it's important? Because, and not just because I have to think it's important because I do, you know, um, I'm a preacher in the, in, in the lectionary church. Um, but here's what I said, and I just want to put that out there to start. It's a day to affirm God's reign over empires that do not hunger and thirst for righteousness. So it's a day to say, this is, this is the kingdom that we affirm. This is the king that, that we are working toward. Uh, and I, I think that's important. I, 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 it's an important act of the church to say that and to be reminded of that. I think it, and, you know, and uh, being on the cusp of, of, the end of the church year, but then going into Advent, I think it's an opportunity for the church to look back. Uh, church, big, you know, big church, and also our individual congregations and say, how did the church work out God's reign? What have we done 
to uh, to to further the kingdom of God here and now? Where where do we see that embodied in what we have done in our ministry? And then it's it's looking forward to Advent and to say uh, that you know Christ's kingdom will come in this in this little child born in a manger and um, what what will what will we do um, to be citizens in this kingdom? What uh, what are some of our aspirations now as we sit here on November 22nd? So it's a time to think about that too. So that's just, um, and maybe that's the own, the preacher's own reflective time uh, as well. But uh, I love that question. Uh, and it made me stop and think about why is this Sunday important? And, uh, and maybe you have different answers to that, but we can get to the text now, but I wanted to share that. Thanks, Graydon, for asking me that question. I'm going to say amen. Thank you for uh, sharing that with us. I really appreciated that, um, that reflection and that invitation. For me, this is a text that um, uh, I don't know uh, if this is true across. Uh, in fact, I'm almost certain it was, it's not true across the United Methodists, but across Michigan United Methodists for years, uh, this was the text that we had our ordinance preach. And uh, so I have heard all I have heard all kinds of interpretations of this particular text. And this year, uh, the question um, that I just was uh, hanging around uh, as I read it is um, the question of what is it that you have done? Uh, it's uh, a similarity of the question uh, that uh, when John sent his disciples to ask Jesus, was he the one or should they look for another? Jesus described not, Jesus didn't answer yes. Jesus said, go back and tell John what you've seen. And they were the things that Jesus has done. And you've heard me talk about um, uh, the fourth chapter of Matthew before getting into the Beatitudes that Jesus does before he speaks. He works before we get his words. And so at the end of this gospel, I find it an, a great opportunity for us to ask ourselves, what is it that you have done? Because that seems to be the question that this text is saying that God is going to be asking. Um, have you fed the hungry? Have you provided for those who are thirsty? Have you clothed the naked? What have you done? I think that's the question to ask of this text. I um one of the things we say in our tradition is every Sunday is a minor festival of the resurrection. So every Sunday is a resurrection festival. And every Sunday is likewise a Christ the King festival, uh, proclaiming the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ in a world in which it sure doesn't look like Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, so you've got uh in the for, litur for churches that still use the standard liturgy and sing the, the Gloria um, or the, the this is the feast, right? Worthy is Christ, the lamb who has, who has slain has begun his reign. The lamb who has slain has begun his reign. What? That's what we used to sing every Sunday when we did the whole liturgy. And it sure doesn't look that way. And that's a quote from Revelation, of course, which... Uh, the book of Revelation is a testimony in a world of the Roman Empire where it sure didn't look like Jesus was Lord. And we do that every Sunday, but then we set aside one Sunday really to talk about it. And so I like to think, I mean, imagine pictures. Where, where do you see pictures of the American Empire or wherever your context is? Because our listeners are all over the world. If you're in China, the Chinese Empire or the, Roman, uh, the, the Russian Empire, what, what do snapshots of that reign look like? And then what you get instead is snapshots in the gospel lesson of what the reign of Christ looks like. When the naked are clothed and the hungry are fed, or as my uh, brother once said, as the naked are fed and the hungry are clothed in a sermon. Um, when the prisoners are visited and set free, as it says in the Psalm, right? Uh, that snapshots of the invisible kingdom of God in this world are 
not just orders of how we are to live, but they are that. Like the, last week, the talents this week, the, the, the bridesmaids, we do get in these uh, farewell, uh, it's not the farewell discourse, but in this, these last Final mile of discards, you do get pictures, snapshots of what it looks like when the real Lord of creation's reign breaks into the present. Which I think is uh, a really important point, um, Rolf, to say that in, in terms of the literary placement of this, that this is uh, immediately before, uh, you know, I, the preacher should not necessarily not add these verses, but just, you know, 26 1, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, and he's been saying a lot of things, uh, you know that after two days the Passover is coming and the son of man will be handed over to be crucified. That juxtaposition of, of the, the empire of God or the reign of God, the reign of Christ in feeding the hungry and clothing the naked or clothing the hungry and feeding the naked, uh, and the setting the oppressed, that vision then is contrasted with what the Roman empire will do to Jesus. Uh, that is, that is, that is so striking there, uh, and and how what a critical uh, reminder to the disciples that this is this is what God's kingdom is about. But you are going to see a very different kind of kingdom at work, a uh, very different kind of empire at work going forward, uh, and. Uh, and how is it that, that you, like you said, Rolf, aware of these snapshots of what I have shown you, what I have revealed to you, trusting in that of what this, of what God's kingdom looks like, because it's going to be really hard to see that in the days ahead when the empire, the Roman empire uh, is, um, is, is, seems to have all the power and it does by killing, you know, by Jesus' death. So I think that's uh, I, important and where, you know, the, that we often live in that contrast, that juxtaposition of knowing and trusting in the reign of Christ and yet being surrounded with empires that are opposite of that. I'm reminded of one more thing, um, you know, which is that it's, when we so that's the the miracle um first of all neither uh in this it's the sheep and the goats and neither one of that group knows who they are um so separate you're the sheep you're the goats and the sheep says when did we do this oh you know oh you know when did we meet you so they don't know it so there's a there's this mystery of christ breaking in but also then that it's, um, it can really uh, be a model for the Christian life. After Mother Teresa died, this was in the 90s, um, there, was a, I was, there was a secular NPR reporter interviewing uh, one of Mother Teresa's disciples and saying, well, what made, what made her great? And, she, and, he, and he's, uh, he said, well, she just had a simple philosophy that the beggar, the naked person, the hungry person, when she um, helped them, she was, she was encountering Jesus Christ. He said, no, no, no. I mean, what made her great? I mean, and he said, he just kept repeating it. And, he, and, she, and then, well, was she a great leader? Did she have a management style? And you could just tell this person had no place to put the simple gospel message. And there must have been, you know, she must have had a Harvard MBA or, you know, uh, and she operated out of a very simple, uh, this parable drove her life. Absolutely. And it is so, uh, as you're describing that, uh, it, and it, it, it's similar to the distinction between the empire of God and the empire of the world, uh, that all, all that we know is looking for uh, some type of way of categorizing. Uh, I, I really appreciate lifting that up, Ralph, that um, this, is, um, this is just a way of life according to God's design. And in that, we live into the not yet kingdom. And uh, the, as Caroline was speaking, I was also thinking of this verse 32, all the nations will be gathered before him uh, so it's no longer 
um, the Romans against the Jews or the the Greeks against the Jews. It's it's no longer us against them at this point that those who will experience this abundance of God are every nation, every tongue, everybody is gathered here. And that's peculiar, uh, as, as your example, I think, lifts up for us, Ralph, that every nation has its sense of power, of its might, of its riches. And every nation will have to scratch its head when it realizes that what the true presence of the promise of God looks like is when the least are experiencing the abundance of God right here and now. Maybe that's a good, a, a good segue or a good way to move to the Ezekiel text because in Ezekiel 34, then we get this description of, of God as shepherd uh, and, and of course, there is also uh, the realities of uh, condemnation of the less than um, good shepherds <laughs> of, of Israel's leaders. But here we have this description of, of, of what God provides. Um, search for my sheep, seek them out uh, as a shepherd seeks out their flocks. And so I think, you know, for the preacher, this could be one way of, well, how do you, how do, how do you know when the kingdom of heaven is at work, or how do you know when the kingdom of God is at work? And 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 particularly the le leaders who profess to be uh, leaders in that kingdom. Uh, and and here we get uh, here we get a description of what that what that looks like. So that's how I would use the Ezekiel text is to um, to uh, let it be a, a way in which you're unpacking even more um, a vision of a realm that, uh, that is often really hard to see. I it's a great, ben. it's a great passage to pair with last week's Zephaniah text. So last week's Zephaniah text, Zephaniah is a prophet right before the end of the Southern kingdom of Judah and before it goes into exile and God, and he says the day of the Lord is going to come like this, you know, when God's future breaks in, it's going to be judgment. Then this is half a generation later. Ezekiel is born in Jerusalem, probably. He goes into exile with the first wave of deportation in 597. From exile, he preaches then as a prophet against the rebellion until then the city falls. And then after, he turns and he preaches hope. And so this is preaching hope. So in this case, when God's future breaks in, it's, it's hope. Uh, it, sorry, it's it's salvation, it's uh, return. And uh, as I always say, but I always, I think it's important in the ancient Near East, shepherd is always a metaphor for king. And so when God says, I myself uh, will search for my sheep, God is saying, we're done with human kings. I'm going to return to my place as the king of the people. And just read through this text and notice all the absolute promises I myself will search, I will seek, I will rescue, I will bring, I will feed, I will feed, I myself will shepherd my sheep, I will seek the lost. And you could just keep going through that and, and notice uh, just the unbelievable, um, I don't know, it's like the end of the 4th of July fireworks. It's the, it's the finale of uh, promises. If you're looking for texts uh, that make promises, uh, this is about as good as you can get. I really appreciate you lifting up again that uh, uh, recognition that shepherd and king metaphor are, are interchanged back and forth. Uh, uh, that sort of goes to the idea, Caroline, that you like to bring up in terms of, are we supposed to be a prophet or are we supposed to be a pastor in our preaching? And uh, the leader is to care for the flock with enough caring to be able to confront uh, as well as comfort. And, and this idea, you stopped um, uh, uh, in your listing, Ralph, you stopped at, at the voice that, uh, at the verse that says um, 21, because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak because of what 
the people of God did, the, those who were supposed to be caring for the flock, they failed to attend to the weakest. God says, I'm going to do. And, and if we turn that back, to the, the Matthew text, what is it that we know about Christ? We know that in Christ, we see God active uh, in the flesh, God dwelling among us. And so if we are to be like Christ, then the behavior that we are to exhibit in the world is exactly what you listed, Ralph, and not the worldly empire's practices of might uh, over the week. Especially, by the way, that you there is directed to the shepherds, the kings. Yes. So the leaders, let's say. And then notice the messianic promise. And this can lead us into Advent. I myself will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. Okay, David's dead. David died, oh, let's say, I don't know, 500 years before this. So when Ezekiel says, I Wait, will set, are you David is dead? Yeah, at this time. I know. I know, shocker, right? <laughs> Meaning the Messiah, I myself will set up over them one shepherd, my servant, David. David as genre here, David as Messiah. And of course, Christians, we confess that that's Jesus, which then Caroline, as you've already helped us link back, is crucified two days later. So that's the David. Uh, the psalm, and well, obvious links here with uh, we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. It's such a beautiful psalm, portion of the psalm. Uh, and I think, uh, I don't know, this, it's not, I mean, it's, again, if, if you're talking about that, you know, that trust in, in God, uh, and, uh, and just like you said, at earlier Rolf about just the 4th of July fireworks of all the promises of Ezekiel. Uh, you had the I, 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 right. And, and that's God, God doing this, sending, feeding, bringing uh, all of that. And then, and then what, what if like at the end of the sermon or when you're talking about all this or it's somewhere at, at, really at a critical point in the sermon. And then in verse seven, you have, and guess what? He is our God. <laughs> and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Um, just that, that, that acknowledgement, right, of here you have this, this extraordinary litany of all that God does as the shepherd. And then, and then we say, that's our God. Um, and and we're, the, we're, the, we're the sheep. Wow. Uh, that's how I would use this psalm. You know, it's the psalm is um, an enthronement psalm. Psalms 93, basically, I think it's like 44 and then 93 through 100. The psalms that proclaim, specifically proclaim that Yahweh is king. Um, and Bill Bellinger, uh, my friend, has a, a lot of great commentary on the website. But it all goes back again to proclaiming the reign of the triune God in a world where it sure doesn't look a lot of time like there is a God in charge, but it is. And so, you know, you get this, the Lord is a great God, a king above all gods. That is right. The Yahweh is king of creation. So, I mean, beautiful savior would be a great thing. Caroline and I, Caroline and I it's hard for us to sing because we're over Zoom and so you get a, a two second uh, or know, a half a second. Um, it doesn't sound good. We don't sound as good <laughs> like we yeah. used to. Although people say we sound better on podcasts because they can turn us down or off <laughs> than we do in person. The sea is, is for he made it, right? The sea, the place of rebellion, the metaphorical place of chaos, the sea is his for he made it. Yeah. And then, of course, then the intimate personal, we are the people of his pasture. Anything on, let's go. Uh, we don't have any more until uh, next, uh, till after Holy Trinity next year. We don't have a semi-continuous Old Testament text, but we do have Ephesians. Ephesians. Uh, I wrote the commentary, so that's- Yeah, I was gonna say, I like 12 the years ago, 12 years ago. Wow, that's how long I've been doing this. Good grief. 
But you know what? Um, it struck mm -hmm. to me, uh, and and you can go ahead and follow this, but but what was striking to me, Caroline, is that it was so continually re relevant. I was surprised that it was an old one. Well, uh, it is. <laughs> but it feels uh, it, it feels absolutely uh, contemporaneous. Mm. It doesn't feel uh, that's what that's dated. Enjoyed. Doesn't feel dated. Doesn't feel dated. Not mm -hmm. dated. That's me. Like actually, like even you look at me now, and I don't even look twelve years older. It's not. It's, not, it's no, amazing. Not a day over. <laughs> what really speaks to me out of the text this week is uh, the end, verses twenty-two and verses twenty-three. He has put all things under his feet. That is Jesus' feet. When we think about the reign of God in a world that is in rebellion against God and made him the head of all things for the church, which is his body. So that this mysterious, this mysterious spiritual unity we have with each other as Christ's body and with him in that body. So we are part of this mysterious reign of Christ. What speaks to you out of the passages this year? Well, you've got, you've got my commentary, but I, I think um, as I was rereading what I wrote, uh, I, I, uh, I talk about how that the notion of power, dominion, rule, and authority, which fits with Christ the King and the reign of Christ, um, is reimagined through the life of the believer. Uh, and I think that that's something that, yes, it's, yes, it's Christ, the reign of Christ, but, um, but we are citizens of that kingdom. And that's a, you know, theme that we've been talking about. Uh, but that, um, but that God's power is also at work at the believer toward good works, which we get in Ephesians 2.10. And so it's, um, it, 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 I was reading some, uh, somewhere that, you know, the church is not a spec church is not a spectator sport. Uh, it's not, it's, it's not just observing the kingdom of God, but really recognizing, uh, it really recognizing the way in which and embracing this idea of God's power at work in us, uh, I think is the, and what that looks like and what that looks like, particularly uh, in the lives of uh, and your believers. And I, and that's where, again, verse 15, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. And I think that that could be a really powerful, meaning, meaningful verse for people to hear, just to have them that, that rhetorical effect of, I have heard of your faith in the Lord uh, and, and acknowledge that. That's, that's where I would go. How about you, Joy? I totally um, uh, fall in that same verse. I just think particularly in the moment that we're living in right now, that it, it is important for people to be reminded of the places where they've seen God show up in their community among one another, to look for that, and then to be in prayer with and for one another. Uh, not in judgment, not um, calling out, but at this point to just pause and to be in prayer with and for one another.